box, right? Okay, I'm very sorry for the short interruption. Um, let, let us to continue from, this is very important. The background is very important. The background of global governance is very important to understand the following problems and then to understand the opportunities for us and for you as the younger generation. Okay, we are living in a networked world and the global governance is building on this networked world to govern everything. Okay. And, okay. So we understand the first part, we understand the background of the global governance. I try to simplify the background from the end of the Cold War, the study of international trade and the study of international trade. We are linked with each other. And it seems we are, in, we are living in network to work. However, today, and I think every student noticed that, we are facing very urgent problems in the globalized world today. And there are many, many problems. I will talk in my own perspective, three important very, very important problems that we are facing today. If we cannot resolve such problems, the fate of the global governance will be very low. Okay. I will talk about three problems that are emerging from the global governance. And I will try to say why they are emerging from the global governance. The first is the climate change crisis. The second is economic inequality, and the third is national security. So let's talk about the climate change crisis. And I think the climate crisis, and everyone noticing we are facing climate crisis today. And this is a picture that to show the temperature are rising. And even, even someone from the, someone don't believe maybe climate change is happening, but we are truly noticing the temperature is rising. And the sea level is rising with the temperature is rising and the sea level is rising. And you can imagine, especially for some countries in Asia, especially for some small island countries in South Asia or in other states, in other parts of the world, if the sea level is rising, it means someday that small island country will disappear. And it means where such population, where such global citizens will go if their states, their territory disappear from the world because of the climate change. And the climate change is rising from the CO2. And it, it, you say the level, the emission of the CO2, the current level here is much more higher than 50 years ago. And because of the effects of the global climate change, we will notice the sea level rising, the wildfires in Brazil, in China, and in other states. For example, in the United States, in California, right? This we seem to have never experienced before such wildfires, and also the drought in other states. And it, it will influence, actually, this extreme climate change will influence the food safety. You understand? Because of the change of the climate change, our food is lacking. Maybe we are experiencing the food shortage. That's one side effect. Another side effect that I just tell you, it will influence where people in small island or in other states will go. 
and it will influence the political dynamic among states because of such effects. And this is the at-risk countries you can notice from the lecture. So you will notice, okay, why, and maybe you have a question now, right? Is why climate change crisis and the climate climate crisis is related with global governance right we are living in the ninth world today and we are when we are entering into the international trade agreement or entering into international peace we think we enter into internet peace forever and we have experienced the kyoto protocol kyoto agreement right and just the two o's maybe several years ago, the Paris Agreement on governing the climate change. But until now, the question has not resolved, right? Everyone noticed that the Paris Agreement is voluntary and it's not binding, it's not real binding. That's, maybe you have learned in public international law, that's a, that's the weakness for general international agreement. So that's the climate change, right? It's because we are conducting international trade, we enter international peace, and we are linking international each other, we are linked with each other when we are conducting international trade, when we are conducting international investment, we are producing CO2. We are causing the climate change. The side effects in retrospect affect the fate of our global citizen. And you understand the, that's the first problem I want to share with you. And the second problem is economic inequality. The logic here is that, okay, we think we enter into a golden age, right? And if every people can benefit from this globalization, can benefit from the global governance. However, with the election of Donald Trump, the, US, the current US president, we are noticing that, we are suddenly noticing, you not know, everyone, is benefiting from this global governance process. Someone are omitted, someone are lost in this process. And because of this economic inequality, you will notice that that's my own explanation because there are many factors, but that's one important factor why President Trump is elected, right? Because President Trump correspondent to the need of the lower workers, the middle-aged workers in the United States. And I just give an example of the United States. This kind of economic inequality happening every, almost in every country. In China, I'm not sure why they in India, and you will notice that the gap of the economic inequality is also rising, right? And so, if economic inequality cannot be resolved, then someone, the past, the people who are left in this process will raise up their hands to against this system. They establish global governance system. They establish WTO. They establish what kind of a World Health Organization or establish World WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, because they think this in global governance or international kind of a system, what's their relation with my fate, okay? I'm left. Guys, you should care about my fate. So that's the economic inequality, okay? From emerging from the global governance. Maybe when we design, we are thinking, it's, it's very simple. When we design this global governance, after the Cold War, we think, we really think everyone should benefit and every state should benefit. Every, today, you will notice that I will give example of the United States. 
is that the rich get more income from investing than other states, yeah, than other Americans. You will notice the top, top 1%, top 0.1%, that the rich get more and more and more fast than the average the people. And the worker pay has not keep raised with the productivity since 1970s. That's, you will notice since the 1970s, the worker space, the blue line, and the net productivity is the right one. It's not keeping up. And the Wall Street bonus, right? The, mi the Wall Street bonus, the minimum wage workers' earnings and the employees in the Wall Street bonus, okay? Uh, they are huge, huge gap. And the US response service haven't gotten a rise in 28 years, in 28. How can, how much after the Cold War, right? We only have more than 30 years of international peace, of international governance. And in 28 years, the US response service hasn't gotten a rise, rise right? How can you imagine that? And the richest Americans have the fastest income growth. The simple is that if, have, if you have more money, you will earn more money in a very fast pace. And this is just the sample, right? And even the gap between the top 1% and top 20% is huge. You say the top 1% and the top 20%. This is very serious economic inequality. The CEO co-worker pay gap, almost nine times as large as in the 1980s. This I have stood, right? So that's the economic inequality. I will try to explain Again, why economic inequality is related with global governance in a one sentence. Again, because when we enter into global governance, we think everyone are benefit, right? Yes, everyone seems benefit. Every state seems benefit. But it means that, yes, maybe everyone's salary is rising, but the gap between different groups of the people are larging, are becoming larger and larger. Huge, are becoming huge. Okay, that's the second problem. There are many problems emerging from this global governance. So there are a group of people are doubting the value of global governance and globalization. I just provide the three, three examples, three important examples here. And the third is national security. Because you think about it, there are some, some trends in national security. You, I think you guys are noticing. It seems today we are living in a world full of security concept. Everything is linked with security. Right? The security in the Cold War, right? In the World War Wars, in the period of World War I and World War II, when we talk about security, it's about the war conflict. In the Cold War, it's about the nuclear power, right? We are worrying the deaths of people's lives. And today, when we're talking about security, we talk about data security, right? We talk about economic security. We talk about the privacy of the individual, right? We, it seems everything. We also, this global pandemic is clearly a national security. We talk about the public health, right? It seems everything is linked with the security, right? Yes, everyone seems a benefit. Everything seems benefiting from this process, but our national security, including individual security, is threatened in this process, right? 
because from the state's perspective, the, the security is part of the security is the most important. Three trends in national security I just provide. One is that it's a broad concept. It's of this concept of national security today seems includes everything. Second, it's self-judged. It means that whether something are national are belonging national the group of national security, it is determined by the states themselves. Just if the states think that okay, the data security is security national security, then it's national security. If the states determine that in my you also notice the news from the New York Times that if the states decide the Huawei campaign located in China is a threatening U.S. national security, then it's threatening national security. That's the meaning of self-judgment. It's determined by oneself or by the states themselves. And the third trend is that we are moving from the military security to economic security to data security. I'm not sure to other security. I just described. You can say the climate change is also a security, right? The economic inequality is also a security. The economic security. So there are three, three trends in national security. And I just provide you an example from National Security Law of People's Republic of China, Article 2. You will notice this national broad concept of national security, right? The regime, the sovereignty, the unity, the territory integrity, the welfare of the people, sustainable economic and social development, and the other major interests of the states are related, not faced with any danger, not threatening internally or externally. So it seems everything, guys, is national security. So the question give to you is why there are such strange trends? Let's so the question for you to think is why we have such strange trends? Let's go back to the global governance. Think about it. in the global governance, in the international peace period, we ended the, the Cold War. We ended the traditional war, Cold, including the world wars, and we are linking with each other because based on starting from the international trade, go to international intellectual property organization, go to World Health Organization, go to international investment, go to the internet, right, period. And we are linking, we are really linking with each other. We are really linking with each other. So based on this network effects, if one problem happened in a certain state, it will cause the other problems in other states or in the globalized world. It means that, so it means that if one thing can happen, for example, if one, what kind of uh, cybersecurity event happened, right? It can cause effect in other states. So it seems everything can affect, if everything affects this networked world and everything can be national security. Right? So that's my own explanation for such three trips. It's all, so until now, I want to explain this basically three samples, three examples, national security chain, right? Economic inequality and a climate change crisis. I will explain more about climate change. Why such imminent problems are related with the global governance we established 30 years ago. The problems give you to think, give the, to the, your students, your younger generation to think is that, yeah, when we design the global governance system, right, right? Our intention is very good. Our intention is obviously very good is that 
we will enter into the period, the golden period of international peace, and everyone will benefit from this process. That's the purpose we establish the system for global governance. However, my point is here is that maybe when we design that system, we never imagine, we never imagine the climate change today will be the most important, you know, security problems. The economic inequality, the economic gap is very huge today. And national security is emerging from everywhere. When we design that system, we never think such eminent, such problems can happen because the system is designed 30 years ago. So how to address the problems emerging from the global governance? That's my third part is for you younger generations is how to build multilateral cooperation and international opportunities. I just want that cooperation maybe is an international obligation. How to address? Let's still take such three examples. First, how to address climate change is, the first is whether it's a technology problem or political problem. It's related with our theme is multilateral cooperation. The Bloomberg speech in MIT commencement last year clearly says that today, even today, we have sufficient tech skills to cope with the climate effect. But still, states are not cooperated in these problems. And instead, you will notice that even this year, right, all kind of wildfires happen in Brazil, in California, in China, and in other states, you will notice the effects of climate change are threatening people's lives. They are causing the food shortage, right? They are causing much more side effects are threatening people's lives. So my point is that, okay, we understand the climate change is not a tech problem. We have sufficient technology, advanced technology to, to find, to cope with this problem. It's a political cooperation, multilateral cooperation, okay? And then we come to the international agreement. This is the international environmental agreement. You will notice that we already have 1,300 multilateral agreements on the environment of protection. 220, 2,200 bilateral, right? This is only on environment. So, and for climate change, right? Multilateral environment agreement, right? That is the treaties, protocols, amendment. We will notice. Oh, we have so many international agreements already. It seems we are really cooperating with each other to cope with this important climate crisis, right? But still you will notice, okay, even we have such, so many agreements, but the problem seems have not been solved. What really happened? Even we have a Paris agreement, this milestone agreement for resolving climate change, right? But still country, this is a voluntary and a non-binding target. The, the Paris Agreement has a non-binding, yes, I have to say it is a milestone for climate change, and, but it is still no binding and it is still depends on the states themselves to conduct whether they should follow the Paris Agreement or not. So, but let's go back to our say. We are causing, we are called the global governance, right? You will notice that, okay, we have so many agreements have not resolved this very important to 
program. What the problem happened? The problem is, okay, one would say that if you have to take public intervention or no, you obviously know that because this international agreement is not voluntary, right? That's the weakness. But think about the, this global governance. See, the same of uh, the logic of the global governance, right? Everyone is benefiting from this process. Who benefiting the most? Who benefiting the most in this international trade period? The companies. The multinational companies are benefiting the most in global governance. Yes, I have to say they play very positive role to advance the international peace, to link our each video. But you will notice that they benefit most, but actually they also produce the most greenhouse gas emissions. This is just the 100, top 100 companies have been the source of more than 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions since 1988. So it seems my point is that, okay, we're talking so many international agreements, but it is still no target on the real, real producer of greenhouse gas emission. That seems, but that's the real producer, this 100 companies, this multilateral companies, really benefiting from the global governance, right? They are conducting international trade, such as Google, or Amazon, or Facebook, through intellectual property governance or intellectual property strategy. They are expanding globally, right? but they are real producing greenhouse gas emissions. They are the most important source. That's not, not very correct, right? So, okay, that's my point, is how to address national, that's the question. I want to, there are all kinds of uh, proposals. There are climate change clubs, right? The carbon tax, where we will tax the companies, right? So my question is left to you, the younger generations, you to think, really think deeply about these problems and that's your opportunities, right? Because until now we really have not provide sound solutions to this problem. Okay. Then addressing national security. How to address this emerging, the broadening concept of national security with self-judged nature? The problems will happen is that if every state, or if every state can say that, okay, it is a part of the national security. So you cannot invest, you cannot cooperate, you cannot co communicate with our state, you cannot co co communicate with the people. If every state has that kind of power, then we will, and we will maybe return to the Cold War, right? The purpose of ending the Cold War and enter into global governance is to achieve international peace. If every, now you will see that every state are trying to assert broader national security to block something that they think is improper. Maybe block international investment for our for other states. Maybe block uh, some speech, right? Some free speech, right? Because the content is they, they are not welcome because they assert the reason of national security. From the states themselves, these are some of the reasons. Because it's national security, it's part of the sovereignty of the state. Yes, everyone can agree. National security is the most, is maybe the most important part of a national sovereignty. We should protect the national sovereignty, yes. So we should protect national security, yes. But the problem is that 
if national security can be abused, then maybe we will return to the Cold War. So how to address national security? Your younger generations have your own ideas. And I just provide four proposals that's related to my own research project. Maybe there should some work committee or working group try to, for example, the regional committee or working group, right, to resolve, to coordinate different states on the security matters, right? Second is the internal cost. Yes, you can assert the national security, but you must compensate for the loss of the foreign investors because of your national security. And third is that even you can know the of certain national security randomly. You have to follow certain domestic administrative procedure in states, but that depends on the states themselves. That depends on states. We hope the states has very constitutional administrative procedure to determine why the some things are national security or not. But it's really depends on the states. And maybe there should be some court, a standing multilateral call to decide why there's something on national security. And this committee, the first proposal, the committee or working group is actually has some, has been proposed in the WTO. The World Trade Organization, when the WTO is trying to be established. And the internet, these are all the flowing proposals for you to think, and you can have other proposals to resolve this conflict. What conflict? The abuse of the national security concept that can cause we global world to enter into the Cold War again, and the sovereignty of the states to really effective govern the security, okay? Then, how to address economic inequality, right? Think about it. it is it still related with, is it still related with the global governance perspective? When we enter into that period, we think everyone are benefited. The transnational cooperation benefit the most, right? Where does that money go? Where that group of money go? It didn't go to the ordinary people. It didn't go to the middle and the low class people. It go to the richest people. It go to the multinational corporations. It go to the investor of the multinational corporations. It didn't go to the ordinary employees. But obviously every state and every, maybe every multinational corporation benefit from this process. But we as the middle and the low class people have not benefited so much. So that's causing economic inequality and that's cause people are against system of global governance. So the problem is, yeah, then if we notice the reason of the economic inequality, then it's how we should govern this transnational cooperation. Should it be governed by domestic law, by international law, by public international law, or by international organizations? The transnational cooperation, there's actually different from domestic corporations. Why is it they are transnational? They can escape certain domestic regulations to benefit themselves in this network world. And secondly, they can cause harm to the people. For example, they are the produce the most greenhouse gas emissions, but they cannot bear responsibility. 
So how to govern this transnational corporations? Second, my own proposal is, okay, people are against the World Trade Organization, then we are not today while negotiating the new generation of a trade or investment agreement. Different states are in negotiating with different parties. Why does such new generation of regional trade and investment agreement can reflect the needs of the ordinary people, can reflect the power, the labor power, right? So maybe you has other ideas. So that's the problems and that's my own proposals to resolve the problems. And you maybe have your own ideas to resolve climate change crisis, to resolve economic inequality, to resolve national security emergency, right? You have your own ideas. So let's go back to multilateral cooperation and international opportunity. I will introduce the background. We have talked about the World War I, World War II, Cold War, international trade, international peace, right? There's a group of lawyers, right? After World War I, there's a group of lawyers who want to outlaw war, you know? And they have established a pact to outlaw war. Then they have the Geneva Convention. This is built on a group of lawyers, a group of individuals for achieving international peace to outlaw war because before 1920s, war is legal. Before 1920s, war is legal. You can understand? And they want to outlaw war. War cannot happen. They want to protect people's lives. So this, in, this group of internationalists facing, in that period, facing the death of the people, they want to outlaw war to protect people. And you as the younger generations, you as the younger generations today are facing problems. Very, pro very important problems, maybe are much more important than outlaw war. Climate change crisis can decide the fate of our humanity, the economic inequality, the national security. You are facing a new stretch of global problems. And it's really depend on you, whether you as the international leaders can resolve such problems and I can build a better world. That's your international opportunities. You can maybe in the future be an international arbitrator to resolve a business and a human rights problem. You can do transnational litigation to litigate against you know, climate change effects. You can participate in international organizations or you can build with other international leaders to build international organizations like 100 years ago. So because of we have such important problems emerging from the global governance, that's your opportunities today. Thanks for your lecture and welcome question. Thank you. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, by mistakenly, I have made you a host. So can you please make me host? I have uh, a tag box as well. Okay. There are some questions in the question and answer. And one says that, how do you say and economic nationalism and masculine army power affect basic principles of international trade and that of globalization in current scenario. 
And there's another question is taking the perspective of international governance. Could we solve or at least make a difference in economic inequality by charging the other rich or 100% more taxes that could be distributed to the public domain? Yes, let me answer the second question. Because we talk about inequality, economic inequality, and tax is a very important tool to redistribute the wealth. The wealth are actually not, not made by the rich. They just have that kind of power and money, that opportunity. And yes, that's one proposal, but that's one proposal seems very effective that we can target the one top one percent or top ten percent. Yes. And the reality is that the top one percent or top ten percent people in the world are not only they are rich, they have the political power to maybe control the state's policy. Yes, that's one difficulty. And another difficulty you will notice maybe from some examples. Yes, certain states maybe can target, can tax the rich, but the rich can move their assets because we are living in this globalized world. The rich can move their assets to Singapore or to other states to avoid the taxation. Right? You will notice that the multi companies, maybe the GE, actually the most profits are located not from not in the United States. So you will notice that the, the former President Obama asked the GE to retain their profits in the territory of the United States. But yes, they can have their power to you know to plan their wealth distribution. So it needs, I mean, the second difficulty is that it needs global cooperation to target on the in economic inequality. One state's power is limited. Okay, that's my answer for this question. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before going into the next question, uh, yeah. I would just request to uh, please open your chat box. I have written something. Checkbox. Let me say. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me say how to transfer the host. Okay, so there is a setting uh, that you have to go to more. There is an option of more. Mode. Yeah. Before, before you okay, I get go, it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you have to go to on more, and then you have to uh select on uh the host. I mean, you have to select the host. You can. More rename? No. No. Just beside of rename, so. Add, add, add a profile picture? No, sir. Um, okay, sir, let it be. Okay. No problem. You can continue with, sir. Can we take next question? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you see an economic nationalism? Yes, we are experiencing economic nationalism and masculine army power affecting basic principles of international trade and that of globalization. Yes. We, especially in the current, pandemic, you will see that the states are pulling back, are moving 
some very important manufacturer back to their own states, right? To, the, to produce products because they think all this globalization cannot protect the basic safety. We cannot produce the face mask, right? To protect our people. And we, we should, that's the one background is that, okay, we should also grasp the advanced technology by our own states. That's the economic nationalism. You, every, every one of you are noticing today. And I have to say, it's very unlucky. It seems we are moving from the globalization to a fragmented world that to be more and more nationalized. You are not noticing that Maybe in the future, it's not only economic nationalism. Everything, maybe you will notice the internet nationalism, the free speech nationalism that are retaining back. Because when we're talking about global governance, it's built on international, the basic principles of international trade. If trade are retaining, if the economic nationalism is arising. Then some said, some set of things that based on economic international trade can also be nationalized. So that's, that's my judgment of the change. If, so the students is very clear is that if we cannot resolve the economic cooperation problem, if we cannot, you know, weaken or reduce economic nationalism, then it seems we will experience, we will fall into another trap that we will have everything be nationalized. That's my answer to this question. I'm not sure whether there are any other questions. Very sad. I'm very sorry. And oh, yes, there are other questions. Yeah. Do you believe that obstructing trade can lead to better na national security? My answer is no, is that obstructing trade cannot lead to better national security. Is here the problem is that, okay, we build this world global governance. If, if, let me answer this question from different perspective. Yes, if obstructing trade can lead to better national security, right? Then we don't trade with each other. We don't cooperate with each other. Every state leave themselves. But the problem here is that, the problem here is that we are really cooperate, linked by this global government. You see from the example of this pandemic, if one country cannot resolve this pandemic, cannot resolve this COVID-19, then every state is unsafe. Even you can resolve. But because of this pandemic is global. So every state must cope this pandemic, then we can ha have security. Understand? So I just gave you an example, says that obstructing trade cannot lead to better national security. It depends on how we govern this new national security that are different from traditional national security, such as the war conflict. How we govern data security, how will we govern cyber security, how will we govern climate change security. It's, so that's my point is that there are different proposals, so really this kind of security you will notice the character is transboundary. It cannot be resolved by one, one state. So it needs multilateral cooperation. And that's for you, your opportunities, okay? And 
could you please share your views on the effects of international trade after COVID-19 and international trade restrictions? Well, this COVID-19 has some negative on international trade. And actually this negative already happened before the COVID-19 and it's accelerating in this pandemic, amid this pandemic. And my views, well, my view is that, yes, the international trade maybe will experience very some difficulties. But in the world depends. There are actually competing forces in this world is that there's one force are denouncing international trade like the, like the United States and then one group of force still still asking for international trade. And it's, it's really depends on this composition of these two groups of forces and it depends on the needs of these global people why the people are still need global trade to benefit themselves. Yes, maybe large countries like the United States, right, can live in this world without trade with any people. But how about very tiny, small island countries? We, China and India are very lucky. We are two super population countries, right? But certain things people need cannot be produced totally by one, maybe certain tiny country. So how do you resolve that group of people, right? So my point is that you maybe are really determined by the two group of forces, two force, two kind of forces. One asking for cooperation and international trade, one asking for decoupling from the international trade. And the second is still the, pe the people's needs, why the, the global citizens still need international trade to benefit themselves. How will be the situation of international trade? I think this is a relevant question, right? How will be the situation of international trade you will notice that we have some limits, right? You will notice there are some policies from the certain states and the WTO is almost, uh, you know, not non-functional now today. And states set their barriers, set their policies to international trade in this period. And you will notice that states are still you know, still based on the principle of a competitive advantage, still cooperating on the basic medical supplies like the facial masks, right? Yeah. So people are still benefiting from this globalization of the world because of the comparative language to protect the lives. I take the face mask ex examples, but still people stretch set boundary, territory barriers, set other barriers to stop international trade, to stop international investment. And this is related with, to another question is that, especially the high technology are returning to be territory. Okay. My question is, do all large corporations and financial institutions contribute to the generation? contribute to? Well, I would say yes. I'm not sure what's a, uh, I would say yes. Basically, large co corporations and financial corporations are the major forces for globalization. My point in this lecture, yes, because through globalization, they make the most profit. And my point is that yes, they make the most profit, but but they are also causing problems like the greenhouse gas emissions, like the economic inequality, even like the national security. For example, I give you an example is that, let's talk about cybersecurity, right? When we are talking about cybersecurity, who owns the cyber? Who owns the data? 
it's a multinational corporation. Yes, certain states require smart, certain multinational corporation to submit the data to states, right, to, to disclose. But still, multinational corporations own this cyber, own the data. So it means that when we talk about a new national security, it's related with multinational corporations. So how can we govern this new national security? It's not only states can dominate this process. It's a good, good question, thank you. And the last question, the human toll of the gun was the first wave of, to strike the world this year. It's severe. If the COVID-19 pandemic was the first wave to strike the world this year, it's a severe economic consequence, including loss of livelihood of the poor across countries. Yes, the very severe consequence have been the second way. How the global governance will help to come out of this economic inequality in India? Well, it's related, also related with the last lecture, the IP kind of strategy, but I will address. And there's a story I, I'm not so clear about the economic inequality in India, but I will answer from the following points is that this COVID-19 pandemic, yes, the first wave, you will notice that the people who suffer from this pandemic, the majority of people are the lo lower class peoples who cannot have a basic needs, right, during this pandemic, who cannot have, cannot, for example, maybe cannot have sufficient face masks to protect themselves. They are low, these are the effects of economic inequality. But when we are suffer from, when the COVID-19 is coming, Majority, the majority of the suburbs are the low class peoples. So the poor, it means that yes, the poor across countries. And even it will affect the food safety, right? And it will affect the trade, right? People can maybe, you know, people don't trade with each other maybe during the COVID-19. So how the global governance will have to come up this economic inequality? My first point is that, yes, people should live. That's a basic human right. People should survive in this world. People's lives, right? So when we, yes, our only hope to come out of this COVID-19 pandemic is depend on the vaccine, right? The effective vaccine that can distribute to everyone in the world. So it is still the function of the global governance. If we have no WHO, we even cannot monitor this pandemic, but we can enhance the function of the WHO or enhance the function of the globalization. No, global governance is that when we have the vaccines, how can we utilize the system of global governance to really distribute very cheaply or even free of these effective vaccines that are essential for people's lives? That's the function of global governance, that to protect the basic life of people's needs. Think about it. If we have no global governance, right, the so states only care about themselves, right? If the states only care about themselves, if a one certain country, yes, event, finally event the vaccines, but do not share with this world, it means other part, other states will still suffer from this process. Or even when a state's event finally events the vaccines, but the price is very high. That means that the poor in certain states can still cannot enjoy the 
benefits of the vaccines to protect their lives. So it really depends on the global governance system to create cooperation to invent these vaccines, to effectively distribute the vaccines, and to protect the poor in the world, including the poor in India and in China. So I want to end here is that, yes, it really depends on you, the younger generations, to cooperate in to maybe rescue, to resolve the problems emerging from the global governance, to enhance the power of the global governance, to protect every individual in the world, including the poor who are suffering now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I take this opportunity and propose a word of thanks. Uh, Firstly, I would like to express my gratitude towards Professor Jima, senior lecturer, Peking University. Uh, despite of uh, his busy schedule, sir has given us time and shared his view on uh, multilateral cooperation. Um, sir has given an elaborative idea about the national security and international trade in COVID situation as well. Thank you so much, sir. I express my gratitude towards uh, our beloved principal ma'am, Dr. Kranti Deshmukh, for her guidance and support. I would express my uh, gratitude towards teaching, non-teaching staff of SCLC. And last, but obviously not the least, I would express my gratitude towards all the participants for their active participation. Uh, before ending this session, there are two uh, announcements. Uh, first is uh, related to feedback uh, that you have to give compulsorily feedback session wise and the links will be provided in a telegram group. So you have to look into the uh, telegram group and for further instructions for tomorrow's instructions again we will be updating you on telegram group. Thank you sir. Thank you all. Glad to talk with you guys. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Should I end this? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. I will end this yeah. as a host. Thank you and have a good day. Yeah, have a good day.